Welcome back uh, at the Chaos West TV stage, uh, second day. Hopefully you didn't lose your sense of time already. Uh, that seems to be happening uh, to people at the Congress uh, quite often. Um, but if you haven't and you found your martyr and a good place to sit and uh, to sit and watch, um, we'll have the next talk for you, uh, held by Julian Fitkau. Um, it's called The Elephant in the Background, Empowering Users Against Browser Fingerprinting. So most of you probably know cookies and that cookies are, yeah, a slightly misused tool by the advertising industry, um, violating your privacy. And there are many tools against cookies and it's quite easy to defend against that uh, with some tools. But uh, of course the advertisement industry is, <laughs> yeah, resourceful as ever and they have their new tools called browser fingerprinting. And that's a little bit harder to do. And Julian is from a group of four people that developed this tool called FPMon that will show you when you are being tracked. Um, yeah, and you can check what, what's happening there. And uh, this is a pre-recorded talk that Julian held and um, yeah. I would say let's let's watch what Julian has to show to us. Community and welcome to our talk about the elephant in the background, a quantitative approach to empower users against browser fingerprinting. My name is Julian and I'm the project lead of the research project that I would like to present you in the next half an hour. Before we start, I would like to introduce you to my team that has worked on this project for almost one year now. In the beginning, me and Felix have kickstarted the project and later on Sebastian and Kashyap have joined our efforts because the workload has grown tremendously over time. During the project, we all have been associated to the security and telecommunications research group that is led by Professor Seifert. This is actually a very good moment to thank all of these people for your commitment and support that made this project such a great success, even in these difficult times. But now, let's start our story. Tracking users is an ubiquitous practice in the web today. User activity is recorded on large scale and analyzed by various actors to create personalized products, forecast future behavior, and prevent online fraud. While so far, HTTP cookies have been a weapon of choice, new and more pervasive techniques such as browser fingerprinting are gaining traction. Browser fingerprinting is very similar to cookies, but works quite differently. Instead of just receiving a unique identifier, for a device fingerprint, we need to collect tiny pieces of device-specific data that can uniquely identify a user altogether. Similar to cookies, fingerprinting does not always mean identification or tracking. It is just a technical process of collecting a lot of device data. The lines between using this data for benign operations and tracking are very blurry. Hence, in most cases, we can only speculate on how this data is used. There are many reasonable applications for fingerprinting, such as content tailoring to personalize your browsing experience or to prevent malicious behavior for security reasons. But it can also be used to analyze and identify users. In this talk, we want to describe how users can be empowered against browser fingerprinting by showing them when, how, and who is analyzing them. To this end, we conduct a systematic analysis of various browser fingerprinting tools. Based on this analysis, we introduce you to FPMon, a lightweight and comprehensive detection tool that measures and rates JavaScript fingerprinting activity on any given website and in real time. With FPMon, we will evaluate the Alexa 10K most popular websites to study the pervasiveness of JavaScript fingerprinting, review the latest fingerprinting countermeasures, and identify the major networks that foster the use of fingerprinting. Before we go deeper into this, let's first of all get everybody on the same page and let us understand how browser fingerprinting really works. So let's start with a quick example on how fingerprinting can be done on your local device. This process can be described in three steps. First of all, we will query the device data via JavaScript, which gives us a unified interface to an enormous amount of device-specific data. An easy example can be executed by just calling Navigator User Agent, Navigator Languages, or Navigator Connection to get some of the various device-specific values. 
more advanced techniques will leverage variations in hardware and software to generate a device-specific value. For instance, using the WebGL API, we can apply a set of textures and ambient lights to a 3D object. By analyzing the generated picture, we will get a slightly different result on every device that can be used to improve the user fingerprint by just another data point. Similar methods have been shown for the HTML canvas element and the web audio API. In the next step, all the collected device data is combined to a comprehensive device profile. At best, this profile is unique and reproducible. In the last step, the device profile is used to calculate a hash value that represents the fingerprint. In the last step, the device profile is used to calculate a hash value that represents the fingerprint. Most of all, this is done for a quick and easy comparison. Now, we want you to show how this fingerprinting process is embedded in the web. Most typically, there are three parties involved. A web user, a first-party content provider, and a third-party fingerprinting service. First of all, the content provider needs to embed a fingerprinting script into the content of its service. When a user visits his web page, the browser will download and execute each script included in the loaded page source. As a result, the fingerprinting script will be executed on the user device and starts to collect the device features. Either all the collected data or a simple profile hash is sent to the fingerprinting service. Afterwards, the service provider matches the received identifier against its database of known profiles. If the profile matches, a user is identified or a new profile will be created. In the end, the content provider can access the results of the analysis or receives direct insights, for instance, if a user can be trusted or not. The service provider will be paid by the content provider or monetize its service in some other ways. The first step on our mission to empower users against this practice was to understand and classify the JavaScript functions that are most typically used for fingerprinting. To this end, we have systematically analyzed multiple commercial and public fingerprinting tools that are created by companies like Zift, Iovation, Xeon, and Datadome. In addition, we analyzed several open implementations like Fingerprint.js, MIUnic, BrowserLeaks, and the PanOpticLick project. Hereby, we obtained a collection of 115 JS functions that are used by those fingerprinting tools. Indeed, not every function is responsible for fingerprinting, but when combined in a specific order, these functions are indicative of fingerprinting activity. In the next step, we classified those 115 functions into 40 different features, where each feature represents an individual vector to fingerprint a user. Some of these features cover functions that read out device screen information, the configured languages, or more complex ones, like functions that are used for WebGL and audio fingerprints. To account for the different capabilities of these features, we applied a simple weighting mechanism by labeling each feature with a severity rating. Less critical features have been labeled sensitive, while more problematic ones are labeled aggressive. Clearly, none of the classified features is only related to fingerprinting. More importantly, it's even fundamentally impossible for a user who visits a website to know whether she's fingerprinted or not unless it is explicitly stated. However, we argue that the combined use of the JavaScript functions is a strong indicator of fingerprinting activity, especially as more aggressive features are being used. When a website uses many of the sensitive and aggressive features in a particular composition and in a very short time, it becomes very likely that the device fingerprint has been created. This idea is the fundamental core of our quantitative fingerprinting model. After studying all existing tools and classifying all the JS features, our next step was to develop a browser extension that can record the JavaScript functions and analyze them based on our quantitative model. The core idea to implement this was to dynamically add an interception mechanism in front of the classified functions, especially before the real web page context is executed. By modifying the JavaScript runtime with code injections, we were able to intercept and record the functions without altering the default runtime behavior. Another major benefit of this approach is browser independence. This means that FPMON can be easily integrated into any up-to-date browser. 
When using FPmon, the browser extension will inject a script that is executed before any page script. This injected script modifies all the monitor JavaScript functions to lock any function call. While recording each call, we can evaluate the classified features according to our fingerprinting model and hence calculate a fingerprinting score. Based on some well-defined thresholds, we can change the extension icon to be green, yellow or red. This easy to understand indicator will show you if the currently measured fingerprinting activity is low, medium or high. In the icon batch text, we can additionally show how many of the fingerprinting features have been called. To get more details about the measurement, you can click the extension icon. But before we get more into this, let's go ahead and see how FPMon works in reality. Now we will see how FPMon works when visiting a website. We load the page and get an immediate feedback on what's happening in the background. The scripts in the background are executed so quickly that the website is not even fully visible to the user, but the device features are already extracted. When clicking the extension icon, we can see more details about the process that just happened in the blink of an eye. The FPMon Chrome extension will show you how many of the tracked JavaScript functions have been called, how this relates to our fingerprinting features, meaning how many features have been activated, and how many of those features are labeled aggressive. Furthermore, we show a descriptive list of features that are accessed when visiting the website and the top three highest scoring scripts that are active on the page, which helps to identify the root cause of the fingerprinting activity. While we now understand how FPMA works and how to use it, let's start to browse the web. We will have a short demo to showcase some interesting examples we found while browsing the web with our FPMon browser extension. Before we start, I want you to notice that we don't have any cookies stored, we haven't given any user consent and there's almost no user interaction with the website we will load. First of all, we will visit wallstreetjournal.com. By just loading the page, 25 out of 40 fingerprinting features will be activated. We go ahead and visit nasdaq.com and 30 out of 40 features will be activated. We load easyjet.com and 22 features will be activated. We load bankofamerica.com and 19 features will be activated. When loading newyorktimes.com, 25 features will be activated. When loading coinbase.com, 25 features will be activated. When loading savethechildren.com, 26 features will be activated. And when loading healthcare.gov, 21 features will be activated. Before you start to think that every page uses all of these features, let us check some other examples. When loading google.com, only 12 features will be activated. When loading wikipedia.org, only 7 features will be activated. When loading nsa.gov, 6 features will be activated. When loading the website of the European Parliament, only 3 features will be activated. By loading torproject.org, just a single feature will be activated. And when loading wikileaks.org, not even a single feature will be activated. So as you can see, there's a wide spectrum of scores through a diverse set of websites. What we now need to ask is, what is a good and what is a bad score? So let us draw a baseline to better understand the fingerprinting score. In this table, we put all the previous examples into a sorted list. To this list, we added the pan click privacy test which is a tool that has proven to be able to identify you by just using JS fingerprinting. If we visit PanOptiClick using our browser extension, 21 out of 40 features will be activated. This relates to a total score of 53%. When we visit similar websites such as fingerprint.js or miunic.org, we reach roughly the same scores of more or less 50%. If we consider this as our baseline, we can define that scores of around and above 50% are somehow concerning. 
Looking at the examples we have seen previously, there are many pages that score even higher than this baseline. These websites belong to financial institutions, news media, online shopping and even NGOs. We have to ask why so many device data collected when visiting these pages. Do they identify us? Who has access to all this data? Luckily, there are also much more pages with lower scores that drive very similar applications. To improve our understanding of this, let us increase the sample size. To see the bigger picture, we have automated FPMON to browse the 10k most popular websites and record how much fingerprinting is applied against a user by just visiting the landing page for 60 seconds. From our data, we can conclude that around 500 pages don't use any of the monitored features. On the other side of the scale, the highest score has been reached by only five websites, for example Breitbart, Foursquare and Politifact.com. They make use of 38 features which relates to a score of 95%. When looking into these statistics, we see that the biggest majority of the websites, almost 57%, use around 7 to 15 features. The median amount of features is 11 with an absolute deviation of 5.2. Based on this statistic, we more or less define the thresholds for our website rating. A website activity is rated low if the number of features is less or equal to the median feature use, a website is rated medium if it uses more features than the median website uses, but still less than the upper bound of the absolute deviation. Every website scoring above this range is rated high. Like the red bars tell us, the distribution for sensitive and aggressive features is very different. Hence, we also make this distinction when rating a website. Based on our rating scheme, we labeled 53% of the 10k most popular websites to be low, 28% to be medium, and 90% to be high. We also found 10% of the websites to score the same or worse than our baseline, such as the Pan Opti Click project. In another evaluation, we had a closer look on how many websites use each of the monitored features. We see various features are used by many websites regardless of how they are rated. But if we look into the right half of the chart, we also see that almost half of the features appear to never be used by websites that score medium or low. It seems that those features are used against the interest of the user and never serve a benign purpose. For these cases, we have to ask how important are these features? What website really needs to know CPU, audio, memory, connection and battery details in such a short time and when just visiting their landing page? When comparing with previous research, we can also see that the utilization of these techniques has grown tremendously. In six to seven years, there's 10 times more font fingerprinting going on and three times more canvas fingerprinting. We think this development is quite concerning and this is a good point to start thinking about what really needs to be accessible by a website. In another experiment with FPMON, we wanted to figure out who's profiting from this technology. Therefore, we started to analyze all scripts that we discovered when crawling the 10k most popular websites. First of all, we noticed that the majority of aggressive fingerprinting attempts is only caused by less than 1% of the scripts. When analyzing each of the scripts, we were able to identify some of the major networks that foster the use of fingerprinting. To do this, we classified each script based on its hostname, file name, its fingerprinting score and a fingerprinting signature. The signature is basically a list of all the features accessed in their particular order. By combining all these properties, we found more than 100 networks of different sizes. None of these networks that reach a high score is present on a sufficiently large number of pages to reliably track users across the internet. However, some organizations are on the edge of becoming a real threat to internet users. Their network size might be comparatively small at the moment, but they include high-profile pages and hence can analyze millions of users every day. The most harmful networks we discovered were created by Mode, that is now part of Oracle, and a company called Zift. They both reach a score of 50% and above and are present on roughly 50 websites. If you visit one of their client's websites, their script will collect your device profile and send it to their own network. Some of the affected domains are Breitbart, Wall Street Journal, New York Post, Udemy, Patreon, Kickstarter, Flickr, and so on. However, 
While they are the most threatening ones, smaller networks are following their lead, such as Datadome or Adform. Another interesting one is the Lalaping network, a network of 17 streaming websites that share a common fingerprinting signature with a score of 88%. In the bottom part of the table, we also find less harmful networks, such as Akamai. The fingerprinting script reached a concerning score, but at least the collected data is only sent to the content provider and not to third-party service. Today we know that the data collection is part of their bot detection service. However, we need to ask if harvesting such vast amounts of device data without user consent does justify its purpose. Another example is the network of Google and its subsidiary DoubleClick. Despite their huge network size, they seem to not analyze users based on the monitored fingerprinting features. In our last experiment with Epimon, we have evaluated how well a user is protected by some of the most popular anti-tracking tools. For this test, we evaluated EFF's Privacy Badger, DuckDuckGo's Privacy Essentials, Firefox with its strict privacy mode, and the Apple Safari browser against a set of 20 test cases. Unfortunately, most of these tools do not provide sufficient protection with respect to browser fingerprinting, but are hopefully still useful against other forms of tracking. The best solution that we found to work in most of our test cases was the Apple Safari browser. The underlying reason becomes clear if we look at how these solutions are implemented. While the plugins and Firefox work only based on blacklisting of well-known fingerprinting services, Apple has integrated a new and very different approach based on unification and herd immunity. Apple's Safari browser only supports a very simple and unified system configuration, which makes most Apple devices look identical. This reduces the capability of fingerprinters to identify a single device without breaking web functionality. In conclusion, Apple has simply implemented what we have seen earlier in our feature analysis. There are too many features that don't have any value for the web user and are maybe even used exclusively against their interest. Hence, the best solution against the growing threat of browser fingerprinting is to unify and reduce the amount of data that is collectible via JavaScript. To conclude our findings, we have seen that fingerprinting is present on many websites with sensitive contents, such as health insurance, financial institutions, news media, and NGOs. In many cases, the number of collected device data is so extensive that user identification might be easily possible when comparing this behavior to research that have been done by projects like Panoptically. Furthermore, fingerprinting is very stealthy and concealed. Many of the websites collect sprawling amounts of user data and send it away within milliseconds, often before the page is even fully visible to the user. In our experiments, no user interaction takes place and no consent is given. We think this practice of concealed data collection clearly subverts privacy regulations such as GDPR or CCPA. Based on our experiments, we want to question the capacity in which owners know the practices and true power of the third-party services embedded on their websites. For some of these networks, fingerprinting seems to be part of tools that are used by website administrators to maintain their services, for instance, for bot detection, analytics, or security. Many fingerprinting scripts seem to be part of specific online services that ultimately collect vast amounts of user data. For example, archive.org has almost no fingerprinting activity, 7%, but their donation page scores 90% because of a single third-party fingerprinting script. On the other side, the New York Times scores 60% across their website, but deliberately disables all data collection on their dedicated whistleblowing page, 0%. These are just two examples of two popular websites that should underline that some people might actively participate on this technology, while others might just be victims. Last but not least, we have shown that most anti-tracking tools cannot sufficiently protect users. To really protect users, we need to simplify and unify the JavaScript interface and not extend it with just another useless feature. If you want to see more technical details and more results of our work, I want to invite you to read our paper. We have published our paper and the FPMON browser extension on our website that you will find on fpmon.github.io. For any further questions, you can participate in the following Q&A or just contact us via mail. Thanks a lot for your attention and stay healthy. Well, that was a super interesting talk. Um quite crazy actually that uh, you know this fingerprinting is, is so popular sadly 
um, and interesting to see some uh, names in there. And uh, luckily, we have Julian here as well to the pre-recording uh, to answer some questions. So if you have any questions about what you've seen there, about the tool, or in particular about fingerprinting in general, maybe, um, you can still send us questions uh, either using the social Twitter using the hashtag RC3CWTV or in our ISC channel, uh, it is RC3-CWTV on the HackInt network. So feel free to join in there and our signal angel will pick up those questions for us. And I do see that we do have some questions in the chat already. Um, so I don't know. I think we can start, Julian. Um, First question, uh, probably very interesting to, to many, many. Uh, what about U-Matrix? Uh, is it possible to block fingerprints with this extension or is uh, FPMON like a completely different beast? Uh, so I don't know actually about uh, this metrics tool. And I also see that uh, there are many people asking for mm -hmm. other extensions. So we only have tried those four tools because we tried to uh, look at the most popular ones, let's say, or the ones we did know about. Mm. Uh, so this U matrix, it looks very manual. Like you have to, like a firewall, you have to configure it mm. quite in a quite detailed way. And it might be a solution for very, uh, for, for people that are really specialized into this, but I think it's not a solution for my mother, for example. Yeah. And um, that's, that's what we want to look at. Uh, I think your tool has a quite different uh, approach here where you matrix is like you choose what you need to block and your tool like shows in the first place what is even being tracked and what is happening there you know mm. it's like two different yeah. approaches i think yeah in the moment we are only monitoring what happens mm. um so we have thought about defense mechanisms but when we have seen that there are solutions that don't work in the moment we didn't want to just publish another one that doesn't mm. work in the end yeah so it was actually really the work to understand what's happening what's yeah. going on where do i get fingerprinted mm. and what the networks behind it yeah yeah, and maybe with this data now that you know what exactly is happening, you can target much more precisely instead of like mm. doing something that might or might not work. You don't know. Yeah, yeah. that's basically the next step we are targeting at in mm. the moment to like get some resources and uh, then push this further because we have also, as it was mentioned in the talk, we have also found that like. Oh, it seems we're having mm, some I mean, blacklisting issues. sounds very reasonable. Then. Uh, could, could you repeat the last sentence? We had a small connection glitch there. Yeah. So I'm back now, right? Yes. Yeah. Or so, okay. Just a small hiccup. Um, yeah. So as we have seen, there are really just a few scripts that do this in the moment, but they are spread across the web. And mm -hmm. uh, so maybe blocking something might be still a good solution, but so far it seems that they haven't targeted the right domains or something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you have any Firefox support plan? Because <laughs> that's a good question. I also mm -hmm. in the background try to install it, but I'm a Firefox user. doesn't seem like it works there. So for our tests, we had a Firefox plugin, but uh, we haven't published it in the moment because mm -hmm. uh, we we cannot really manage to um, uh, yeah to take care of this actually. We have a Chrome solution. It's also used with Chromium, which is the platform we use actually. And um, I can emphasize to use that. Mm. But it should basically also work in Firefox. But maybe the UI doesn't work so mm -hmm. in, in this way. Yeah, for our automated analysis, it has worked, but we haven't published it. Maybe mm. we do this in the future. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Maybe you can, uh, you know something about this, but how do you think is the effectiveness of uBlock maybe against such uh, fingerprinting measures? Um, I think uBlock is also just based on blacklisting and mm. many of those tools might even use the same blacklists by mm. some which are yeah, published by some companies yeah. or smaller projects. 
And from that point, I would uh, bet that it's maybe not that effective. And the best solution we have is unification and simplifying of those interfaces, which is a completely different way to think about this kind of problem. And I think it's also the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the Safari browser is not available for everyone, but um, yeah. I mean, I think the Firefox guys, they could maybe also take the, up this idea uh, from my point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you maybe know what metrics uh, Apple or the Safari is, is using and why it's so, uh, so effective? Like I think you've shown uh, in one slide that it's one of the most effective, if not the if most effective solution right now against us. Um, mm -hmm. Does it work similar or does it just count function calls or evaluate it somehow in the background? Mm. No, so they have some, I mean, they have a completely different approach than blacklisting. Mm. They use, they simplify and unify the JavaScript in case. So if you call browser and ask, hey, uh, what's your user agent? What yeah, we're having some really uh, bad connection issues right now. They only have a very limited. Yeah, um, we, we'll try something, um, Julian. Uh, I'm very sorry, but could you in your uh, in your webcam share this little eye icon on the bottom, an Augen? Uh, symbol click on that and we'll disable the webcam so we can save on some bandwidth maybe that will help the audio connection yes so the Did screen it work? Just... yeah exactly so now uh, we sadly cannot see you anymore but hopefully we'll have more bandwidth for the audio mm -hmm. um, can you repeat mm -hmm. the last answer please so apple has chosen a completely different way uh, they mm -hmm. simply find unify the javascript interface and this way, you cannot distinguish between different devices uh, which use Apple's uh, operating system. Mm. And that's actually a solution I would like to see everywhere because so the JavaScript engine so far, or the, let's say, useless features, or nobody really uses many of those features, which are used for fingerprint. And um, yeah, that's, that's actually a better way instead of blocking some weird domains because we have also seen scripts that had have used uh, dynamically fragmented and they even used uh, randomized domains to hide mm -hmm. their fingerprinting. So blocking wow. is not a valid solution now and it will not be in the future. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same for IP blocking. <laughs> yeah. I guess the block so, is currently fighting the same thing, you know, in the yeah, DDoS yeah, block yeah. one IP, <laughs> the next one just pops up. It's yeah, yeah. really hard so, to mitigate. To make this maybe more visible uh, with the Apple device, everybody looks a bit the same. So you cannot distinguish between yeah. the different users. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if everyone has the same fingerprint, then yes, you get a fingerprint, but it's pretty much useless. It's a good strategy, I mm. think. Yeah. 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 Um, did you by chance uh, check out uh, the Tor browser? I, I, maybe the Tor browser also has mm. some Apple-like countermeasures to this fingerprinting. I think there was a lot of headlines a few years ago because mm. suddenly people realized, yes, Tor will hide where you are coming from, but not mm. how your browser looks like, right? So I don't know, is, is the JavaScript in, enabled by default on the Tor browser? I'm actually not sure, but I think they do have an extension default uh, usually mm. that will, um, yeah, will have something. I'm seeing in chat that someone commented that um, Firefox has a resist fingerprinting setting, and it seems like the Tor browser has this active by default. Do you know how useful that is? So at least for the with Firefox, we have tested actually exactly this case. It's called strict mm -hmm. privacy mode. And it's not, it's not, so it's maybe the best solution from those we have seen, uh, but it's not as good as the one from Apple with unification and herd immunity. Mm. Yeah. So it works in some cases, but it also didn't work in many other cases. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but hopefully better than nothing. And yeah, I'm just hearing from the chat that uh, JavaScript is enabled by default mm. uh, in the Tor browser. Yeah, but they have a lot of other tools that try to block stuff and mm. different levels of protection. So hopefully you're sort of safe there. Um, 
but as we heard, it has this resist fingerprinting function. Yeah. And in the end, it's uh, again what we had in the beginning of our QA. I don't know. I mean, we as specialists might start to use Tor and child privacy, but it's not true for yeah, everyone. Can you repeat that one more time? That was broken up. So the Tor browser is not used by everybody, right? So then mm. most people will use one of these default solutions, which you can yeah. easily install and so on. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we have one question from Twitter. Finally, I think this is the very first question from Twitter that we have at this Congress. Um, did you explore the use cases for these fingerprinting integrations on commercial sites a little bit further? I think you've mentioned that briefly in the talk somewhere uh, about SIFT and especially Akamai that mm -hmm. can use this for like machine learning fraud detection, something maybe for uh, payment processing. Do you have any like analysis of, for example, good or bad fingerprinting? Yeah, so I mean, uh, bot detection is probably and security applications. So in our studies, we also have seen that while you are logging into some services, you are fingerprinted. Mm. And that makes sense to some degree. The question is how this data is maybe shared later on, or who has access to this, or is it used in some other form? And that's mm. actually a fundamental problem here, because like with cookies, we can never say, is it a benign or a malicious use? Does somebody monetize on this data or not? Mm and so on so that's yeah, a complicated that, part yeah that's probably always like a hard question you know uh, data can be used for good and bad and mm. the approach to collect the data might be the same but you never know what people are going to do with it yeah so that's the that's dualism of technology often right yeah it's it's mm. a really tricky thing um and then another question from uh, Fediverse, I think. So somewhere on Mastodon, someone asked if uh, using a virtual machine is an effective fingerprinting countermeasure. Uh, for some of the methods, we know it might be effective. Mm -hmm. But it's actually also an interesting question if you can, for example, then detect virtualization and so on which is at least yeah. Yeah, under security considerations and other interesting topic. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. You'll probably then be able to uh, classify people that try to evade fingerprinting measures. You know, yeah, I feel like, you know, your new user group classification in there already. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's really tricky. And, and as always, it's again the question how yeah, scalable or like how many people do this, right, to protect themselves. Mm, yeah, I still see people using no ad blockers, no nothing, yeah, and I'm correct. always like, how can you even still use the internet with this? It's I've tried it once, mm. and it's unbearable to me. Yeah, totally yeah. agree. And then one more question: uh, Where can this FPmon extension be found? How can you install it if you're interested in doing so? So. At the moment, we have a domain, fpmon.github.io. Mm -hmm. It's also in the end of our talk. And there you get, there's some text and the paper is linked uh, and you can also download it. It's published on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And so far you have to install it on your own as a developer uh, in the de developer mode. But mm -hmm. then you can, uh, yeah, later on you might easily install it via the marketplace, this extension marketplace or something. We are in the process actually to publish it there. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So at some point, maybe you can just go to the store and yeah, click install on. it. Yeah. Click. That seems to be pretty important nowadays that you are, you are on some kind of store. Otherwise, you just don't exist. Uh, interesting <laughs> developments. Not sure if I really yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 So far, it's, I mean, it was a research project. So far, and we now, since we thought, hey, this is really great results, let's publish this somehow mm -hmm. and let people use it. Yep. And um, yeah, for yeah. for us, there's no really. I mean, there's the only incentive to give it to people is that they get awareness of fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. So we don't record anything or something that would 
make this tool super useless, right? Yeah. Uh, we thought about maybe studying this or something like this, but it's again tracking of users, so we we don't yeah. want to do this. So yeah, that's why we have to yeah give it out and get some trust by people that they yeah. also say, okay, I install this extension which could uh, just basically see everything I do on the web, right? Mm. Yeah, of so course. That, uh, conflict yeah. yeah but i i think uh you know just enabling people to recognize the problem is like the first step to a solution you know it's something you always yeah. say recognizing the problem is the first step yeah. and uh maybe we can get some traction we had so many talks uh on mm. the stage already that showed like hey there is a problem and mm. in the old spirit of two um maybe yeah. something something happens out of this yeah true that would be great Yep. Uh, oh, there's also, I think, yeah, that's yeah, that's one of the key strengths of FPMon. It can visualize something which you don't mm -hmm. see usually. It's too yeah. quick, and it's too hidden to see it. And with this tool, you can make it visible. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, one more interesting question: um, Can browser plug-in fingerprinting be circumvented? I'm not uh, sure no. if this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Actually, yeah, so you can also fingerprint use on other layers. You were like breaking up again. Can you restart? So. Sorry. Yeah. So other layers are not protected. We only uh, target JavaScript fingerprinting, which is, from my mm -hmm. personal opinion, the most uh, important one so far. Mm -hmm. You also have something like uh, TCP fingerprints, for example, but they are not as sophisticated as JavaScript fingerprints, for example. Mm -hmm. So then you better just track the IP or something like this, right? So Okay. And with JavaScript fingerprinting, you have so much, there's so much weird functionality and kind of side channels to, mm. to figure out what's your audio interface, what's your um, GPU and so on. And that's the weird thing about JavaScript fingerprinting. It has so much access to your device. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'm quite interesting, uh, quite interested. You, you mentioned IP fingerprinting there, how this will turn out with the growing or hopefully growing adoption of IPv6, where essentially everyone has a non-netted yeah. IP. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this deciding behind the NAT gateway in the past worked maybe quite well. If you're mm. like at a university, mm. then many are using the same IP and this doesn't work anymore in the future. Mm. You know, even with the privacy extensions for the time that you have the IP, you can be tracked through that IP probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one more question uh, is setting the language or the localization for your web browser to English or some international thing, uh, international defaults useful so they can maybe track you by the specific language that you have enabled in your browser? Mm. I mean, I won't say mm. it can protect you because it's just a single mm. feature out of, yeah. let's say, four. So it's too little of a change to make you invisible. Mm. Or something. Yeah, it's really depends on how sophisticated their technology is. And if you think about, let's say, AI technology and so on, which is probably already deployed now in this domain, yeah. um, that kind of small changes will be tracked. Mm. Yeah. They have also to use some kind of variety because you also change your location here and there and your time might change in your system and so on, right? So this process has to be fuzzy in some way. Mm. Okay, I'm just sitting here, but I think we've... I mean, there, there are more questions coming in by the minute. Um, it seems like there's a very lively discussion in the IRC chat. So if you are not there yet, you might want to join there. Mm. And I'm not sure, Julian, uh, will you be taking a look at the IRC chat? Uh, I'm, now, I'm and... at the IRC, yeah. Yeah, great. So you're already in there. And maybe you can answer some more it's questions. It's too much to follow on quick. Ah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We can do it like yeah. this. Yeah. And then I guess uh, we'll somehow wrap it up here. And... Mm -hmm. um, Thank you again for the talk. A very inter interesting introduction. And also thank you and your working group for this tool. Uh, mm -hmm. More weapons to defend ourselves are always great to have. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, let's let's wrap it up here. <laughs>